In addition to the plants, uh, another um, part of our important part of our landscape um, are the, the hard elements, the, the non-living um, components. Several of the, the, uh, the gardens that Bernard showed in his presentation um, incorporated local material, those beautiful stone walls that he talked about, um, the uh, grape stake fencing that was used to contain the the sand and to help define those slopes in one of those projects um, are a perfect example of sustainable landscaping, trying to use local materials. Um, it, we can be really um, attentive to using native plants, um, perhaps even focusing on local materials um, with the native plant palette, but then if we all of a sudden start bringing in hard material from halfway around the country or the world, you know, the sand, some of the sandstone that we use for flagstone might come from Arkansas or marble from Italy. Um, it kind of sort of shoots the whole point of being sustainable when you're destroying some um, natural landscape someplace else with the hardscape material that you use. So recycling, repurposing, um, figuring out a way to apply um, found objects in our gardens can be a, a very practical and beautiful way to create our, our landscapes. These examples um, recycle concrete, concrete as retaining walls. I'm not sure where these um, metal, these uh, rusted iron um, wheels are from. I think they're from some farming uh, um, machinery, but they were used as a, a bit of local art in a garden in, San, in the Los Angeles area. For our paths, um, the floor of the garden, um, instead of creating some type of a, uh, a hard surface, um, you could use just the natural leaf litter that might accumulate from underneath your trees or um, bringing in some locally um, available mulch, such as this garden on the, on the left. Another use of a local stone is in the, the tea garden at Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, um, creating a dry stream bed using local sandstone and gravel. And a few more examples. Um, that's recycled concrete pavers on the upper right. Um, and the spaces in between are filled with Daimondia. That's a, a design by Isabel Green. Uh, as is the driveway uh, directly underneath it. Um, I'm not sure what the crushed gravel is, but those are recycled railroad ties. And in the lower left, um, the fencing is um, recycled lumber that was about to be uh, just carted off to the dump, so it was uh, repurposed as a, a fence at the property line in this native garden. That's a rammed earth um, little bench that the owner built himself. And in that same garden in the backyard, all these different paving materials were recycled and put together in, a, I think, a very fun, creative little patio with just um, recycled wooden slabs as seat wall, as um, seating area. Well, one of the underlying principles for um, a low maintenance sustainable garden, of course, is wise water use. Uh, I'm showing you some non-native plants in these examples. You don't have to use only natives, of course, to have a water thrifty garden. So many plants from other Mediterranean regions would fulfill that same function, or, as well as succulents. But how you arrange the plants and is of critical importance in the design. And the, the way that you um, zone the, the landscaping with respect to water use. Um, I think this garden is a good example where she has put water-loving plants around this totally created stream bed, um, which looks very realistic to me, um, using local, um, locally um, obtained granite as the uh, co cobble for the stream and for the pond. And the further away you get from the, um, the water feature, the more drought tolerant the plants are. So really careful um, arrangement of the plants and using the water accordingly. There are just a tremendous number of resources available from water agencies as well as other publications on whether you should be using overhead irrigation or drip irrigation, micro sprays, and I'm not going to stand up here and tell you, you know, that one is better than the other. I think it's totally dependent on 
the, um, the design of your garden. Um, and you may end up employing several different types of systems in one garden just to, to, um, to get the maximum efficiency of the water that you do want to use. They each have their place. And whether you want um, totally water by hand, and some people will swear by the fact that watering by hand with hoses and watering cans is actually more efficient for them because they are paying more attention to the plants in their garden. They're actually out there looking at what's going on, maybe sticking their fingers in the soil and checking for moisture, um, and only watering when they you know, feel that the plants need it. Of course, that takes more time than automatic systems. Um, time clocks are, are, can be really good at saving water and improving on efficiency, but of course they need to be reprogrammed based on the age of the plants, the age of the garden, um, and what's going on um, from one season to the next. Smart controllers are the new big thing. Um, a lot of uh, water agencies are actually giving people rebates to put in um, new irrigation systems, including um, smart controller time clocks that are um, programmed, that are very much in sync with weather patterns, so they can be a tremendous water savings. But all of that is only as good as how you program them and use them. Somebody mentioned, was it, um, maybe it was Judith, um, the use of bioswales, or perhaps it was Bernard, I'm not sure, um, rainwater harvesting, uh, creating bioswales in your garden, or using rainwater systems, all of these are ways to use water more effectively and efficiently, trying to keep it on site as opposed to running off. Um, nature has her own bioswales, and that's an example of the upper left here. And you can see the darker green is actually a patch of native juncus among these, um, these grasses, um, which is exactly what a lot of people try to create in their, in their landscapes when they're doing um, bioswale construction. And that's my own little rainwater um, harvesting um, off of the roof. And a lot of people poo-poo this because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go very far. It only holds about 50 or 55 gallons. But for my little application, the beds on either side of that are underneath the eaves of the house that I live in, and they get no, almost no natural rainfall uh, unless it's a really torrential, driving, wind, um, windy rainstorm. And so by having a soaker hose hooked up to this, um, I can use the rainwater um, that comes off the roof to irrigate those beds, and I don't have to water them um, additionally. So for that purpose, it's really um, helpful. I know Bart hates mulch, but I think mulch has its place as a garden for a lot of different reasons. It just depends on what kind of mulch and using the right type for this, the right composition of plants. Um, mulch can help you suppress weeds, um, it can keep dust levels down, it can retain moisture in the soil. If it's an organic mulch, um, as it breaks down, it can help improve the overall texture of the soil, and it can add organic matter to the soil. Um, moderate extremes in temperature. There's just a lot of, um, I think, benefits that accrue from using mulch that will help you to reduce um, maintenance needs over time, as well as save water. But it does require you know, some thought in, in their application. Um, this garden on the left is next to a very once weed-choked um, riparian corridor. And while the non-native plants are being pulled out of this site, um, as the young, new native plants are being added, we're using um, some local wood chip mulch to help suppress those weeds while the native plants um, gain hold. And oftentimes that's not a, you know, a one-time only endeavor. You have to reapply mulch as it um, gets too thin. In some other applications, um, organic mulch is not appropriate at all. It changes the chemistry of the soil and it's not really um, what the plants um, are used to. So a gravelly mulch might be better. Um, the image on the bottom is uh, just a rocky slope um, in Anza Borrego, uh, in the, out in the desert, and prefer. And sometimes no mulch at all is, is just as good as you see here in this constructed garden. These plants don't need it. They're not getting any supplemental water. There weren't any weeds apparently in this area to have to contend with or minimal that could be handled with just hand care. 
Natives have a reputation of not um, being um, de high, highly demanding with respect to nutrients, and so having to constantly throw fertilizer in your native garden is usually not necessary unless you're really trying to change um, the soil that you have. It's far better to work with what you have and plant plants that are going to adapt to the, the soil that you um, have in your garden. But um, you might you know, find that there are certain plants that are just languishing for one reason or another and would appreciate a little bit of um, supplemental nutrients. And so I think it's far preferable to use um, compost, preferably something that you created yourself, um, or at least slow-release organic-derived fertilizer. And one of the best um, um, ways to help to feed the soil and maintain healthy soil is just to allow the natural leaf litter to accumulate um, underneath the trees and shrubs and throughout your garden. It still drives me crazy. After 30 years out here, you know, through all the commercial landscapes from one um, community to the next, how much bare soil we see, that, that all this beautiful leaf litter, it just gets, continues today still to get swept up and taken away, wherever away is. Well, conserving fossil fuels um, certainly applies to the, the tools that we use in the garden. Um, if you don't have a lawn, you don't have to worry about mowing one, or if you do, you can certainly use a, an old-fashioned reel mower or a mulching mower, or something that is more energy efficient. Um, hand tools versus power tools, there's all kinds of ways to, you know, to conserve on resources in, in addition to water in our maintenance practices. Might take a little bit more of our time, but it has um, broader environmental and ecological benefits. If we choose our plants um, carefully, hopefully we won't have much in the way of insect or disease problems, but you know that's kind of wishful thinking. There's invariably going to be something that um, is going to occasionally crop up and cause you some problems. Um, aphids on your salvias, rips on your America. Somebody was just saying they have, oh, Andrea, her hedge that she's going to take out. And you know, America has thrips in the wild as well. So it's not just in a garden that we sometimes have these problems. But um, you don't have to, you know, automatically reach for toxic chemicals. There are all kinds of alternative materials out there, including just blasting um, pests off with a hose that um, are available to us now. So. And the benefits accrue to not just us and to the um, beneficial creatures that visit our gardens, but to other forms of wildlife that may be, you know, in the vacant lot next door or in the woodland across, you know, across the highway. So that's another reason for us to be careful about what we do in our own gardens. We still spend many millions of dollars Probably none of you in this audience, but other gardeners um, buying pretty nasty chemicals to maintain their gardens, and there are better ways. Sometimes it's just um, advisable to not plant things that you know are going to cause you trouble from the get-go, you know, trying to avoid the problem um, at the outset. I'm using this example of a of a deer, but you know maybe it's rabbits in your neighborhood, or maybe it's gophers. And if there are plants that you know um, that are going to be susceptible to that kind of um, animal browse, perhaps you don't put those in your garden in the first place. Judith um, referred to some wonderful bees and butterflies and birds, and I think a lot of us come to. Um, see the value of native plants in our gardens for this reason, this very reason, because we want to have um, some of these uh, creatures in our, in our intimate in gardens. And so if you plant it, they often will come and add a whole other dimension to the landscape. This little wren, I think it's just a house wren, when I used to work at the Botanic Garden, this is uh, right next to the retail nursery, and um, three years running, uh, a pair would just make their nest underneath the potting bench with all of the, all of you know the volunteers and the visitors coming and going, and of course um, serenade us with their song during the nest.